Well, welcome everybody. Uh, you are this evening uh, in the office uh, of Calvary Road Baptist Church. Um, I bought a new computer to put in my library and I moved my library computer into my office uh, because my office computer was dying and wow, does it take a chunk out of your life to get a new computer? Uh, wow, all kinds of things. So anyway, it looks as though I'm posturing outside the, uh, the open doors in front of the church, but actually I'm in my office uh, attempting to deceive the entire planet uh, with, um, what do you call it? I don't know what you call it to have a green screen and some picture up in front of you that fools absolutely no one. Anyway, welcome. I hope your week was a bit more pleasant than mine. Um, I conducted a memorial service for a much admired World War II hero and fine Christian man. He was uh, 89 years old, no, 98 years old. He was 98 years of age, married to his sweet wife for 75 years. And um, he was a guy that was uh, quite a highly decorated combat veteran. He was a medic uh, during the Battle of the Bulge. His company walked into a snow-covered German minefield. And uh, he walked into the minefield to pick up. I mean, he was a brutishly strong fellow, having been a farm boy. And he picked up a guy and walked him out and went back into the minefield and picked another guy up and carried him out. And he did that, you know, I don't know how many times, um, if my memory serves me correctly, 10 or 12 times before he stepped on a mine himself. And um, then when he got back to the, I mean, he was in the army less than a year. <laughs> uh, so he joined the army when he didn't have to, because he had a farm deferment from the draft. Um, went to uh, North Africa for just a little bit, and then went to went to Europe, the European Theater of Operations, uh, distinguished himself with bravery, came back home after he got out of the hospital, uh, married his wife, and they were married for 75 years. Uh, so he was a wonderful guy. And, um, and then uh, that, was, uh, that was Monday, was that graveside ceremony but that was after uh, the Sunday night news was relayed to my daughter who then told my wife, who then told me that my adopted mom and Deacon's wife was promoted to glory Sunday night after church. So my wife and daughter and I will miss her terribly. She was uh, the greatest kind of encouragement to me for the 35 years that um, I've been the pastor of this church. I calculated a, uh, a day or two ago, um, if, you, if you take away 2020 as not counting, even though she and her husband were at almost every service through the pandemic even, um, then she and I had encounters where we shook hands, smiled at each other, talked to each other some 7,000 times um, in 35 years. And so that was a treasure and a delight to me and um, uh, I miss her terribly. And uh, I mean, I, I actually spent more time with her um, after I left home. I spent more time with her than I ever spent with my mom. <laughs> and uh, got along with her better than I got along with my mom. And um, because uh, this woman was, was a wonderful Christian. And then min minutes ago, I learned that a friend that I have known since uh, my college days uh, has just lost his sister. And uh, that's, that's a heartbreak to him, his baby sister. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, I don't know the circumstances. I know that COVID was related. Um, I'm given to understand she had a very serious stroke 
and that caused some very severe brain damage as a result. Um, and I'm sure that the COVID didn't, didn't help anything. So uh, it's a challenge and um, it's, um, it's, um, it's something that you have to deal with if you, if you are a living, breathing human being and um, I, I, I reflect upon families over the last 30 or 40 years of my life, and I've come to the conclusion, you do, know, you do children no good by shielding them from every hard and difficult tragedy and setback of life, since it results in them being unprepared for reality once you are gone. Uh, the time that you have with your kids before they grow up uh, is time that is best spent preparing them for eternity. Uh, and you do not do that by exposing your children to yourself. Uh, that's just, that's just um, naive. You do that by exposing your children to the gospel again and again and again and again and again. Uh, some people, some guys think that, oh, I'm going to be a good dad by, you know, teaching my son how to fish, teaching my son how to shoot, teaching him how to play baseball, uh, teaching him how to shoot hoops. It's like, no, th those things don't prepare anybody for eternity. Um, and um, uh, we are temporary custodians of our children. And, and we, we need to persuade them by the way we conduct ourselves, as well as by the way we seek to train them that this life has been given to us by God to prepare for eternity. And if God allows us along the way to enjoy and benefit from the company of wonderful, wonderful Christians who themselves uh, have prepared for eternity and are busy about the master's business of, of seeking to persuade others to prepare for et eternity, then that's just... Uh, that's just all the good. Um, I have emotionally kind of prepared myself because I, I began to, I think God began to prepare me for dealing with uh, matters of eternity about uh, 11 or 12 years before I came to Christ uh, when I experienced the loss of my great grandfather uh, at the age of 12. And uh, that was when I began to realize uh, what I really didn't want to face for another decade or so. And that's the fact that life is not forever on this earth. And uh, you better get ready for forever. As someone once said, forever is a long time to be wrong. So this is something that you want to get right. So, so what do you do when you suffer and experience uh, losses? of loved ones and, and beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. You thank God for the time he gave you with such wonderful people. And, and you continue to serve him as long as strength permits. And when you reach the point in your life where strength doesn't permit, then you continue your ministry as a prayer warrior. And who knows, by the time we get to heaven, uh, it may result in you discovering that your greatest ministry was when you were no longer physically able to serve God, um, but you were still able to engage in, um, in fervent prayer uh, at the throne of grace. And as the Apostle Paul wrote to the young Christians in Thessalonica, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ, Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. So if God gives you the privilege of meeting something and meeting someone and spending good time with them or an opportunity to observe God's grace in their life, then we should, we should rejoice. On Wednesday, of course, our young nation will inaugurate another president for us to pray for every day. And who knows, maybe God gave us uh, the guy who will be our president, at least for a while, uh, so that we will more fervently pray than perhaps we have ever prayed for a president before. Although I, I've prayed a lot for this present president, and I prayed an awful lot for the one preceding him. So we need to ask God to work in his life, to bless him, and to direct him as he provides over, as he provides, as he presides 
over our corrupt country that desperately needs revival. We have learned in the past couple of months, especially since learning that senators and congressmen knew and had in their possession incriminating evidence that had it been released to the general public might very well have swayed the election. Uh, but uh, the deep state is very, very deep. The swamp is uh, very muddy, very slimy, uh, uh, very foul, a lot of stench. And so um, we very much, we very much need revival from on high. If you're watching this session on YouTube at a later time uh, than the present, please remember to subscribe to this YouTube channel and click the bell reminder to be notified of uploads from the channel if you're not watching via live streaming. If you'd like to receive an email invitation to the upcoming Zoom sessions, uh, please send your request to me and I will pass it on. Let me see if I can hold this up in such a way that you can see it without this. Uh, uh, yeah, right there, here we go, okay. Uh, <laughs> my camera is playing tricks on me. Let's see how I can do this. Uh, well, I'll give it to you just long enough for you to, I, uh, you'll, have to you'll have to freeze the frame, I guess. And it's pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church. And so if you will email me, I'll figure out how to do that better sometime. Um, and if you will put uh, Zoom 73 in the subject line, um, I will know which of our sessions that you are referring to. Three weeks ago, I began addressing the question, what is spirit baptism? And I suggested then that it is a more significant question than many people realize, since the answer affects a congregation's approach to their observation of the communion of the Lord's Supper. Whether you believe in open communion, close communion, or closed communion will be influenced by the answer to the question, what is spirit baptism? Um, and how a congregation deals with matters of church discipline is related to their understanding of the correct answer to the question, what is spirit baptism? Um, as well as their whole grasp of the, of the concept of unity in the Christian community and their understanding of whole chapters of the New Testament dealing with the body of Christ. I watched a, um, a Facebook presentation of, of a guy that I like and, and think highly of um, and some months ago, he read my book. I guess he didn't read it with understanding because he put up quite a lengthy comment on Facebook and, and his comment uh, and references to the church was a reflection of pure European Protestantism and did not reflect uh, Baptist convictions about the doctrine of the church as reflected in my book at all. Um, and so that will kind of have an effect on the way he functions as, as a pastor. Um, and so I hope, I hope sometimes you, you read something and you agree with it, but it hasn't worked its way into your personal theology yet. The first session that, uh, that we held dealing with this question uh, focused on the preaching and prediction about spirit baptism of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, in that initial session, I made mention <coughs> of four implications and conclusions of John the Baptist's prediction about spirit baptism. Let me rehearse them. Number one, spirit baptism is not water baptism. Duh. Number two, water baptism is literal with spirit baptism also being literal but not material while being symbolic in a way different than the symbolism of water baptism. Number three, spirit baptism is not saving, but distinguishing the I versus he comments of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter three. And then number four, spirit baptism is a sign signifying Israel's Messiah. 
That's what John the Baptist predicted it to be. That's what we saw that it actually is in Acts chapter 2. We saw that it actually is in Acts chapter 8, and we began to see uh, in chapter 10. I get ahead of myself a little bit. In the second session, I featured the baptism of the Spirit as it occurred on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and the baptism of the Spirit as it occurred in Samaria and was recorded in Acts chapter 8. The third session last Saturday evening dealt with the baptism of the Spirit as it occurred in Caesarea in Acts chapter 10. There were two Caesareas in the New Testament. There is Caesarea Philippi, which is to the north and to the east of Galilee, in what would today uh, almost Syria. Uh, you can, you can, when you go to Israel, you can visit Caesarea Philippi, the ruins there. It's beautiful. It's marvelous to behold. And then there was another Caesarea called Caesarea Maritima, and that was on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, that's where Paul spent uh, a number of years in prison, and that's where uh, the baptism of the Spirit occurred in Acts chapter 10, with uh, Cornelius and the Italian band and, and those people. We looked at Acts chapter 10 last time, but we ran out of time before we finished uh, because it was a quite a lengthy chapter to read. And there are some interesting features to point out that are typically overlooked by people who study that portion of, of the Bible. Tonight, we continue our look at, uh, at Acts chapter 10 answering the question, what is spirit baptism? Uh, that's part four. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your goodness and ask that you'd bless us, that you might work in our lives, that you might open up our minds, that we might be receptive to the truth. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is spirit baptism? Um, first, it was predicted by John the Baptist. Uh, next, uh, as it occurred on the day of Pentecost. Third, as it occurred in Samaria. Uh, fourth, which we began last time, as it occurred in Caesarea in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 48. I uh, will not read those verses again, but I would like to quickly review some observations that I made uh, and rehearsed to you from Acts chapter 10. First, Pentecost was the spirit baptism of Jewish believers in front of unsaved Jewish multitudes. Second, Acts chapter 8 recorded the spirit baptism of Samaritan believers in front of racially mixed Samaritan unbelievers of partly Gentile and partly Jewish parentage. Third, Acts chapter 10 that we looked at last week records the spirit baptism of fully uh, fully Gentile believers in front of those who were uh, Gentiles, and almost certainly some in attendance who were Jewish. Uh, it would be unfathomable to me that Cornelius, having such a good relationship uh, with the Jewish community of his area, did not have Jewish people uh, there when he was hosting Simon Peter. The next observation, of course, was that Cornelius was a Roman soldier, verse 1. Cornelius, listen carefully now, Cornelius is described as devout, God-fearing, generous to give, and a prayer warrior, and that's just in verse 2. Cornelius's prayers were answered with directions given to him in answer to prayer. That's in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. Cornelius obeyed the directions he got in response to his prayers being answered in verses 7 and 8. The narrative that features the apostle Peter in Joppa, verses 9 through 16, strikes me as a vision given to the apostle to persuade him that Gentiles can be cleansed by trusting Christ. Call not, call not common that which God has cleansed. Uh, and then you go back, go back and look it up yourselves, verses 9, 9 through 16. I think, you, I think you'll see that. 
And then the, the timely arrival of the men sent by Cornelius seems to confirm the message communicated to Peter in the vision that he was given, uh, and that's in verses 17 through 23. Verses 24 through 33 of chapter 10 is a rehearsal of the events immediately preceding the baptism of the Holy Spirit recorded at this venue, including the evidence of the Apostle Peter's ethnic animus toward Gentiles. This guy had a problem with Gentiles. He was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. His, um, his legalism was stretched because he was staying with Simon the Tanner, who was not kosher. A tanner can never be kosher because he's always around dead animals. And Peter was able to deal with that, but he had issues as are referenced later in Galatians chapter 2, Peter had a problem with Gentiles, um, and Paul dealt with him about it. So we see that, in we see hints of that in verses 24 through 33 of Acts chapter 10, and in verses 34 through 43, we find Simon Peter immediately setting about to preach the gospel to those who assembled with Cornelius so though he was a prejudiced guy, he didn't pass up any opportunity to preach the gospel when he thought it was called for. And so he immediately set about preaching the gospel. And, and then in verses 44, 45, and 46, please take note, that is Luke's account of the baptism of the Spirit that took place in Caesarea, where Luke the physician recorded that the Holy Spirit's baptism interrupted Simon Peter's presentation of the gospel. Now, now think about that, if you will. You have an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's got a room full of people. Some of them he brought with him. Some are Gentiles that are there. Some are Jewish that are there. He immediately begins to preach the gospel and while he is preaching the gospel, now think about the significance of this. While he is preaching the gospel, the Spirit of God interrupted him. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 reads, while Peter yet spake these words. So what was Peter's response to being interrupted by the Holy Spirit baptizing those people that were there. Let me paraphrase. Peter basically asked, so he's preaching, he's interrupted by the Holy Spirit baptizing these people, not him, but these people. And then to paraphrase, his immediate response was, does anyone object to me baptizing these guys? And then he immersed them. Okay, so the baptism of the Holy Spirit of those Cornelius and those in his household at the time, that persuaded the apostle Simon Peter, and that, uh, that, that persuaded those who came with Simon Peter, the Jewish Christians who came with him, that these people were believers. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not take place in the lives of people who are lost. Neither does it take place in the lives of people who are turning to Christ, no, whether it be Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, or Acts chapter 10, the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place in the lives of those who are already believers in Jesus Christ. Peter recognized that. So for these people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, they had to be believers. And if they were believers, they were qualified candidates for believer baptism. So let me draw some conclusions from this account of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you may not agree with me, but let me just share with you what conclusions I draw and would be glad to interact with you, would be glad to address specific questions that you raise via email next time we get together. But first, I am convinced Cornelius the Roman centurion was a believer in Jesus Christ before the apostle Peter arrived on the scene. You say, uh, well, what makes you think that? 
Uh, well, uh, he's referred to as devout. He's a prayer warrior. His prayers are answered. He's a, he's a generous guy. Um, his prayers are answered. Um, and then the baptism of the Holy Spirit is experienced by him before Peter finishes preaching the gospel. So the Spirit of God decided this guy doesn't need to hear the gospel. There's no reason for Peter to continue preaching the gospel at this point. I'm just going to interrupt him. I'm just going to baptize these guys. I'm just going to come upon these guys in a significant way, fulfilling the prediction given by John the Baptist in a way that these guys can see. Um, and so that convinces me that Cornelius was already a believer. Then in verse 2, he is described, as I said just moments ago, he's devout, God-fearing, generous, and a prayer warrior. His prayers are answered. He responded to answered prayer by demonstrating obedience. So as important as all of that is, it's really the Holy Spirit's interruption of Simon Peter's gospel presentation in verse 44 that is most persuasive to me. Would the Spirit of God have interrupted a presentation of the gospel if that presentation of the gospel was being made to lost people? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think Peter's audience uh, were already believers. Uh, that means I think Cornelius was already a believer. I, I think the servants that he sent to fetch Peter were already believers. I believe those that he invited to his home uh, when he hosted Peter were already believers as well. In Jerusalem and Samaria, as I mentioned before, have we not observed the baptism of the Holy Spirit taking place with those already believers? I suggest to you that it seems to be the same here. The baptism of the Holy Spirit does not result in sinners being saved. Not here, not in Samaria, and not in Jerusalem. Rather, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does what it was predicted to do. It shows Jewish onlookers that Jesus Christ is the Messiah promised to Israel, whether those baptized be Jewish, half-Jewish, or of Gentile stock. And so that's where I am at the end of this session. We've got a couple of minutes left, and I'm wondering if you would like to, uh, if you would like to ask a question. So we'll unmute the uh, unmute the microphones, and I'll be glad to address anything that you specifically would like for me to address in the two or three minutes that we have left. Anyone at all? Going now. Why is this all important? Um, Protestantism is of the opinion that the way you are incorporated into the universal invisible church, which they believe is a thing, and I am persuaded is not a thing, is they maintain that the way you are incorporated into the universal invisible body of Christ is via spirit baptism. There's a couple of problems with that. Number one, we find no evidence in the New Testament that spirit baptism occurred except in the lives of those already saved. That's number one. Would that cause people to believe that you're saved and for a while not in the universal invisible body until subsequently you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's a question that should be addressed. And, and here's another one. According to Matthew chapter 3, and as we see in Acts 2, Acts 8, and Acts 10, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a sign, which means there are accompanying signals that you can see, that you can hear, that show you what's going on. And, and, and it vindicates the claim that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. Yet, when I came to Christ, on March the 31st, 1974, there was nothing to be seen or heard. There was no sound of a mighty rushing wind. There were no cloven tongues as of fire. Um, and I have been in the ministry for 
you know, uh, 40, coming up on 43 years. I have never seen a person come to Christ with their being accompanying uh, visual indications, accompanying audible indications, accompanying sensory indications that would be necessary if there was an accompanying sign because spirit baptism was said by John the Baptist who introduced it into our New Testament consciousness. He introduced it as an authenticating sign. And so when all of these people come to Christ, whatever, whatever else happens to them when they trust Christ, I, and I'm not suggesting that someone who has trusted Christ is not a believer. I'm not suggesting that someone who has trusted Christ is not a member of the family of God. I, I'm suggesting that someone who has trusted Christ as his personal Lord and Savior has had his sins forgiven, is justified by faith in the sight of God, com, it, it is, is a component of the bride of Christ, um, it is not a member of the universal invisible church. You say, well, why not? Because there is no such thing. The only way you get into the universal invisible body of Christ, according to Protestant theologians without exception, is spirit baptism. Except spirit baptism is a sign. So when did it stop being a sign? <clears throat> That's a discussion that, that uh, I have never found anybody willing to engage in with me. Uh, throughout the entire course of my of my ministry, uh, I, because I'm convinced it's it's not a thing. Uh, it's a construction that occurred during the Protestant Reformation as a way of refuting the Counter Reformation claims of the Jesuits in the Roman Catholic Church, who said we are the universal visible body of Christ. And the Protestants responded, oh yeah, well, we're the universal invisible body of Christ. The way you become a part of the universal visible body of Christ is christening of an infant, the Catholic version of baptism. So it would be asked, well, then how do you get into the universal invisible body of Christ? Uh, 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 oh, spirit baptism, that's what it is. Except that you find nothing in the word of God that supports the claim that there is a universal invisible body and that the way you get into the universal invisible body is by spirit baptism. You say, pastor, 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 don't you think everybody is in the church? My answer, not yet. Eventually, yes, but not yet. You say, well, what do you mean not yet? What do you mean eventually? Ah, oh, buy my book and you'll find out. Nobody has a question. I guess we're out of time. Let's, let's uh, close this off with a word of prayer, shall we? Thank you, Father, for your goodness. We pray that you might help us in our continuing study of this important topic, um, that we might correctly understand the word of God. Help us to recognize that being accurate when it comes to such things as this will reflect on the way we live our Christian lives, will reflect on the way church is done by Christians, and so it's important for us to get it right. Please bless now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and good night. Have a good day at church tomorrow.